The Gospel, the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus observes guests jockeying for a position at the table. He uses the opportunity to teach his hearers to choose humility rather than self-exaltation. Jesus also makes an appeal to, for hosts to copy God's gracious hospitality to the poor and broken. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of the leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose their places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come to you and say, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and for those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may re invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor and crippled the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, and you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of the Lord. It's a joy to be back uh, preaching. I've been back for a few weeks from maternity leave, but first time preaching back, and excited to be uh, here with you all this morning. As we start out tonight, or just this morning, I want to invite you to make a list of five people that you would invite to a special party. All right, so if you're a, one of the kids uh, that came forward, think about a birthday party. Five people that you would like to invite to a birthday party. All right, if you're a teenager, maybe if you've got five concert tickets, who would you share them with? Okay, if you're an adult, if you're going to go to a fine dinner, you can invite five people to this fine dinner. And think about those people. In our gospel reading, Jesus is teaching us about hospitality, or in other words, Jesus is teaching us a little bit about how to party, right? We talked about that with the kids. Um, the lessons at first sound like simple wise words that we would use in order to kind of not make fools of ourselves out in public, right? We don't want to put ourselves in the best seat and maybe have someone, oh, could you make room for so-and-so? So it sounds like good advice, all right? Um, no one wants to be embarrassed. And so we are encouraged to party with humility, looking to the needs of others. So to be not mindful of the other people that are invited, the other people that are sitting around the table, to be thankful that we're at the table and, and be looking out for those other folks. But this isn't always easy. I don't know about you, but for me, this isn't an easy teaching because I like to sit where the action is. I want to sit by my close friends or where I think the best conversation at the party might be, or around the table, right? That's kind of sometimes our natural thing. So there's this tension between not wanting to embarrass ourselves, but also kind of wanting to be where the action is. But Jesus is giving us this word. And this teaching wasn't easy for Jesus' original listeners either. In fact, his teachings were so radical that they continued the momentum of conflict that led Jesus to be, to be arrested and killed. And look at the great contrast between what Jesus uh, taught and the culture around him. So the Qumran religious community was a contemporary religious community of Jesus, and it says about who is welcome to worship God in a community, like we're all gathered here this morning, and it said, no man smitten with any human uncleanness shall enter the assembly of God. No man smitten in his flesh or paralyzed in his feet or hands or blind or deaf or dumb or smitten in his flesh with a visible blemish so think of all of us in our middle school years with acne, right? No, no visible blemishes or any aged person that totters and isn't able to stand firm in the midst of the congregation. Think of my own grandmother who uses a walker, right? So people who aren't able to um, stand firm, let these persons not enter. And in Leviticus 21, no man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame, crippled, or has any eye defect I wear contacts. I don't know about anybody else. 
or has any uh, festering sores. And the social etiquette of the time, so this is a king asking this question in, in literature, um, how ought one to conduct himself at banquets? And the response is by inviting men of learning with the ability to remind him of matters advantageous to the kingdom and the lives of their subjects because these men are the beloved of God. And we see great contrast to what Jesus teaches. And Jesus is teaching us about who are the beloved of God. And he, and he teaches, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may re- invite you in return and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus' teaching on who to invite is a hard lesson for us as well. It's natural to invite our friends and family to our summer barbecues, or to our birthday parties, or to our weddings, or to our dinners. But Jesus is teaching us that our social actions are to be an example of the love and grace of the kingdom of God. Where we sit, who we invite, how we party matters. We get to be Jesus' hands and feet of justice and welcome. Jesus first teaches us that we should party with humility, looking to the needs of others. And again, this isn't always easy Right? I remember one time I was invited by my good friend John um, out to dinner. He lives all the way in Hawaii, and he was coming to Minnesota uh, for, for, a, for a few days, and he invited me out to dinner. I was so excited, and I got out to the restaurant, and I realized he had invited a lot of people out to dinner. And so I ended up like all the way over here at the end of the table, and he was all the way over there, and I was thinking to myself, I came to see John. And I'm not even going to probably get to hear about how he's doing. And um, I didn't come to see all these other people. (laughs) I came to see John, and I was kind of bummed that I was at the end of the table. Um, But I think Jesus is helping us to realize in life, in the kingdom of God, it is about who else is at the table. It's not just about us. And, um, and And I've learned something from that same friend John. He is an example of this invitation. He invites widely. And, uh, and in his life and in his social connections. And even though it's not always easy to be around that, what an example it is to me of the love and welcome we have in Jesus Christ. And this is hard to do, I think, in our lunchrooms, too. If you're, um, I'm not sure in schools here when you get to start deciding where you sit at lunch, if it's junior high or high school or younger. Um, but where you sit, who you sit with, starts to become a pretty big deal. People may, may judge you based on where you sit. Or you may wonder if you're able to sit at that table. Will people let me sit at that table? And so these questions, um, yeah, make sense in our own lives. But Jesus is kind of teaching us um, to not worry so much about what other people think. To not feel like there's only a limited amount of acceptance in the world, but to, to, be, to ground ourselves in the certainty that God has accepted us. And we can go forth into our social relationships grounded in that and welcoming others. We're invited to a humility. And uh, uh, Master Pak, Master Yongchen Pak, taught me Taekwondo over the years. He was was someone who I looked up to from when I was a little child, and then I got to train directly under him at Iowa State for a while. And he's taught many black belts, and those black belts have taught many other black belts. And so we look up to him very um, highly highly respected in Iowa Taekwondo community. And when I trained with him at Iowa State, though, at the end of our workouts, he would be the one to grab the mop and just start sweeping the floor. And that was an example to me of someone um, who lived a humble life, even though, um, and it was an example of humility to all of us. And oftentimes there might be then someone who would take that mop from him and begin uh, mopping, but he always set the example for us, and then was, you know, oftentimes, I guess, exalted out, out of, you know, from, from that position, too, but definitely a man of humility. 
We hear these words, for all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And when we hear that in Luke 14, it reminds me of Philippians chapter 2, in which we hear, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. In Philippians 2, we hear that in humility, consider others better than yourselves, and your attitude should be the same as that is Christ Jesus. And Jesus gave away everything in humility, not concerned with what he deserved as being in the very nature God, but he humbled himself, even to the cross. And he did this for you. Jesus lives out his teaching of humbling oneself. The second lesson we hear in, our, in Luke is that we should party free from social fears with an invite list that looks like Jesus's. We can often be fearful of what others think, deeply aware that we are judged based on what we look like or who we hang out with or how good we are at doing certain things. In school or even in work, it can be a big difference about where you sit and, and who, with whom and how you perform. I think Jesus is not only encouraging this wide welcome, an invitation to all abilities and all social classes, but he is speaking a word of freedom to us, helping us to see that we don't have to be bound by the constant fight for status, looking to the social payoff of an invitation or a relationship. Culpepper writes that this is because so that we might be free to create human community and enjoy the security of God's grace. The church has come a long way in its welcome. I know, I, uh, like I mentioned, my grandmother, I call her Oma, which is German for grandmother, and she uses a walker, and she's an example of faith to me. And she is welcome in the church now, right? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. There's people of all abilities uh, that are welcome. One one gentleman, Joshua Jerome, um, they did interviews of different Lutherans every month in the Lutheran magazine. And he was interviewed just recently, and he's in the I'm a Lutheran profile. And for him, he is uh, competed in the Special Olympics National and World Games. He was a gold medalist in the 4x400 relay. He's also run the 5,000-meter run, 10,000-meter run. Um, he said his first experience with church was in 2005. And he says, I felt accepted at Christus Rex, and everyone was very nice to me. To me, church is a place where you get accepted for who you are, You meet friends, you sing and pray. He goes on to say, um, most people think that people with disabilities can't do things, but I'm pretty good at a lot of things. And if I could change anything, he writes, nobody would call people retards. I really don't like to be called a retard. That is very mean. And he says, people are surprised that I run marathons and can place in the top ten. People are also surprised that I've worked at my job for 10 years. My advice to other athletes is to practice hard and never give up. I'm a Lutheran because I feel like I fit in at my church and everyone understands me. I don't feel different. It's a community of friendships, God's word and singing. It's a place that makes me happy to go to, and I think that is what being Lutheran is all about. One of my friends is Roger Schomberger, and he's a quadriplegic, um, but you'd never know it from interacting with him. He had a neck injury when he was a young adult, and um, so he uses a wheelchair, but he also loves using a skid loader and doing all kinds of uh, work in the dirt, and he's quite the inviter and mobilizer of of volunteers. Um, He oftentimes will volunteer for a project that he may not physically be able to do, but he can recruit the people to get that work done. And uh, he actually owns a whole trailer of canoes, even though he doesn't canoe himself. 
Um, maybe we can invite him the next uh, canoe gathering next summer to help us out. But then he'll, he'll volunteer his canoes, and then he'll have some friends who help unload them and load them up again. He uh, is uh, a true blessing and, uh, and a, a blessing to our church um, that he is a part of it. We've come a long ways as a church, but we have a long ways to go in our welcome. And, and this is an example here of that welcome of Jesus Christ. But can we live into this challenge as we move beyond the doors of the sanctuary as well? Daniel Erlander writes a story about keeping track of points and that we don't need to, um, this, to have this relentless um, counting in our lives between grades and status. And he goes on to talk about Jesus being the one who started to whisper into people's ears, you don't need points. To people that maybe had no points or not many points, you don't need points. And for them to say, maybe it's true. And then it created a community where people were frolicking and enjoying dinners and parties together. And that it was the point keepers who then ended up putting Jesus on the cross. But then Jesus didn't stay dead. He was raised from the dead, and they went on to have pointless parties and enjoy a pointless community in which all are welcome, and it didn't matter how many points one had in that story. What would it be like to stop worrying about social status and about what other people think, and instead simply be kind to others, especially to those who rarely receive kindness? David Lose asks, what would it look like at work, at school, and at the places we volunteer or play sports or socialize to look out for those who seem off to the margin and to invite them into the center by inviting them into our lives? Let, let Jesus free you to be one of the pointless people once again. We don't need to spend so much time, energy, and worry thinking about points and clawing for what we see is this limited amount of favor and acceptance. You are loved and accepted by God. There is no limit. There is abundance. And you can share that welcome with others. At the start of the sermon, I asked you to think of five people that you would like to invite to either your birthday party or your dinner party or to share your concert tickets with. And now I want you to ask you to identify two people in your class or your office or your neighborhood who never get invited to anything. Imagine asking those people to your party. How would it change things at the party? What would it mean to the person invited? I believe it would change the party. And often in joy-filled, grace-filled, maybe even worldview-changing ways. And it might be that they can't return the favor in the same way, but you will be blessed. Our Edge High School students shared about the mission trip to New Orleans a couple weeks ago in worship. And they spent their time with the people that Jesus is talking about. People on the margins, those who are poor, those with mobility issues and struggles with memory, living in nursing homes, those with special needs. They traveled a long way to spend part of their summer with them, to honor them and encourage them. And from the stories that we heard two weeks ago, the Edge youth were indeed blessed by joining them in that party. And remember that when Jesus throws a party, you are all always invited. Jesus knows that you are not able to repay him. You are one of the many many, many invited to receive at the table. Jesus says to you, this is my body given for you, my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. We are freed and forgiven and living in that grace and freedom, we can share our relationships, our tables, our parties, and our lives with the least of these. Amen.